Okay, so welcome to this new DASI seminar about new revolution. I want to thank Professor Mikulainen for very kindly accepting our invitation. Uh, Risto Mikulainen is a professor of computer science at the University of Texas at Austin and associate vice president of evolutionary AI at Cognizant. He received his master's in engineering from Helsinki University of Technology in 1986 and his PhD in computer science from UCLA in 1990. For those of you um, unfamiliar with his work, his current research focuses on methods and applications of neuroevolution, as well as neural network models for NLP and vision. Today, he is going to talk about neuroevolution, a synergy of evolution and learning, where he will review several examples of such synergies evolving loss functions, activation functions, surrogate optimization, and human design solutions for image recognition, game playing, and pandemic policy optimization. Again, uh, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. And whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. Yeah. Oh, thanks, Pablo. Uh, appreciate it. It's good to see uh, such an audience uh, and, and, and also a little different audience. I wish I could be there in person. Everybody would, I'm sure, <laughs> but maybe someday. Uh, but uh, let's, let's dive right into it. That was a really good introduction and what, uh, where I'm coming from and what I'd like to do. Um, it, I've been working on the revolution for a very long time. We started in 1991, actually, uh, with the first experiments of using generative algorithms to evolve neural networks. Um, and it's been a lot of fun. <clears throat> We've been able to do all kinds of fun tasks, uh, robotics, game playing, um, and addressing artificial life issues uh, and uh, virtual creatures in, uh, in various simulated environments. And most of these tasks have been these PomDB tasks where you don't really know uh, what the optimal is. Uh, and you also have a very complex environment where you have to integrate a lot of information and part of the environment is hidden. Uh, and uh, there it's mostly control and behavior. Uh, and uh, it's quite useful in that um, you don't really have any other techniques that would work uh, well in, in such, such domains. Uh, and uh, that, that's the standard original neuroevolution, evolve the weights of the system. Uh, and, and then it performs, evolution performs the entire learning mechanism. Uh, but it turns out that you also have algorithms that are based on gradients and they become very powerful, especially in the last few years when we've had enough compute to really run a scaled up system. Uh, and why not take advantage of those as well, uh, since you have them? Uh, and that's uh, the novel or new current current uh, neural evolution. It's the meta learning uh, for uh, deep learning, uh, where neural evolution today is, most of it. Uh, and, and now you can optimize the architectures of the networks, the, the entire topology, uh, but also other aspects of it, like uh, the design of the LSTM node or the modular structure of the network, um, or maybe even for multitask networks, uh, the entire pathways that exist there. Um, so the question is, uh, can we make these more synergetic? Can we optimize some of these um, some of these aspects at once, and what aspects actually work best, and under what domains? Um, so I'm going to talk about three such topics today, uh, where we are utilizing the synergies of um, gradient descent and the evolution of the design of the neural network. Um, and these are not not just the idea is that. We are not just using evolution as an outer loop and um, gradient descent as an inner loop. Uh, you can do it and there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, but it turns out that there are some interesting synergies while you're doing both at once. Uh, and and that's, that's where the, the fun part is. You get something surprising, something for free, something you put an in, um, program in, because, because you are doing both at once. Um, so these are uh, some, some of the examples. Uh, evolving loss functions um, while you are actually learning uh, and evolving activation functions again while you're learning uh, and then also um, discovering decision strategies where your learning is doing the modeling of the world and evolution is doing the interaction. Um, so you get something that's more than the sum of its part. The learning and evolution synergize and, and give you more. 
So let's start with the uh, discovery of, of loss functions. Uh, and the reason here why this is interesting is that uh, you get the synergy that gives you automatic regularization. Um, all right, so what is a loss function? That defines your goal in supervised learning. Typically people use cross entropy. You can use other losses as well. Uh, the mean average error or mean squared error, for instance. But the cross entropy loss has turned out to be the most common loss function in deep learning. Uh, and for instance, in classification, you compare the labels and you uh, add to the loss if they are incorrect. And, and typically your loss and a cross entropy loss function has this kind of a shape uh, in that if your network predicts uh, the correct label, in this case, it's 1.0, uh, then you get a very small loss. I mean, if it's actually accurate, you get no loss at all. Um, and then the loss increases when your output network output uh, deviates from the correct output. So if, if the network is actually predicting zero, then you have in principle a very high loss. Um, and, uh, and in between, uh, you know, if you had somewhere halfway, you get a smaller loss. So that's, that makes sense. The further you are from the correct label, the bigger your loss. Um, but you can have other things too. And that's an insight the uh, former student of my Santiago Gonzalez actually had that uh, maybe you could adjust these loss functions um, using evolutionary optimization and find some loss functions that might work even better. Um, and he tested two different approaches. Uh, the first one was to evolve the structure um, of, the, of the function itself as a kind of a genetic programming tree. Uh, here we see uh, such, a, such uh, a function described. Um, this is actually the function and, uh, and this is how you form it uh, from, uh, from two parents. Uh, and uh, then optimizing the coefficients of that function using uh, CMAES. So this is a genetic algorithm, two parents, crossover and mutation, uh, and then CMAES, another more, perhaps more sophisticated, more recent uh, evolutionary method um, that allows you to optimize uh, continuous variables very efficiently. Um, so there are continuous variables in, in this tree. You, you optimize the tree separately from the coefficients. Uh, and this way you can get very novel functions because you're, you are actually evol evolving the functional forms from some primitives that you define like logs and multiplication and, and, and uh, exponentiation and so on. Uh, and that works. Uh, a year later, uh, he figured out that this was good, but, but it's maybe a little too creative. And a lot of times you get functions that don't really work. Um, and uh, you might, might get by with a little bit less ambitious approach where you actually expressing the function uh, not as a, as a functional form, but as a, as a Taylor series. So you got an approximation of the function using a Taylor series. Um, and you can decide how many terms you take. And he found out that three terms is sufficient. Uh, you don't need more than that. And you, you can be very, uh, very accurate in what you're doing. Uh, and, and that's what he did, uh, Taylor approximation. He called it Taylor, um, Taylor Glow. This is a Glow for loss uh, genetic loss function optimization. And now a Taylor approximation of it. And now you can use just single algorithm, uh, the um, CMAES to optimize the coefficients of those uh, Taylor terms. So it's a simpler method, more straightforward uh, and more robust in the sense that you always get functions that actually work uh, because they are approximated to these continuous uh, terms. You don't get discontinuities and other things so that might be problem. Um, all right, so the idea then is that you evolve the loss functions for uh, a given task and a given architecture. And you can do that separately for each task and give an architecture so that you actually customize the loss function for what you're doing. And now you have a fitness that's based on validation accuracy. That gives you um, the idea how, how, how good your um, activation function, uh, loss function is. So even very early on, we discovered something very interesting and uh, we're doing that. Um, so here's a result from, from GLOW and we get the same result from Taylor GLOW. Um, and here's again, the cross entropy loss function. Um, or, uh, it's zero when the label is right and very high when the label is incorrect. Uh, and we did not get that. That did not perform best. Evolution found something else that performed better. And those functions that perform better, they often look like this or like this. And what's really strange about it is this part here uh, near the correct label. 
when the output of the network is almost exactly right, you actually get a really high loss. That doesn't make any sense. You know, you're getting punished for being correct. Why would the loss function do that? <laughs> uh, and uh, here's another uh, d display of it. Uh, where does the network actually end up when, during training? Yeah, it does actually generate these, these outputs where the loss is high. So it's not only that it was discovered, it was also used. And also this penalty was used during learning. And then later uh, in learning, you actually don't have those anymore. You don't have those activations of the network output that would incur the high loss when it's correct. So that gave us, gave us an insight what might be happening. What this, this part of the function is doing, uh, it's actually penalizing those networks that are too accurate. I mean, for classification, you don't have to be exactly right. It's fine that you indicate what, which one of your choices is correct. Like you might have one of these activations and that's the highest one in your in the softmax layer that tells you what the uh, category is. Uh, you don't have to be all the way here as long as your correct output is the highest one. So what this loss uh, allows you to do is go away from extreme outputs and, and, and generate outputs in the mid range. And this way you're less likely to overfit. Uh, it requires a lot of energy. It requires a lot of work, a lot of high weights to generate these outputs with high output values. So let's not do it. Let's keep stay in the mid range and you can learn in a more regular manner. And that's what the network automatically does. It learns regularized uh, solutions and regularized solutions means that you are uh, going to generalize better to, to new uh, examples. So that was a fascinating insight. And it was something that we were surprised about and didn't really even understand at first, uh, but it makes sense when you actually look at it. So you have a evolution discovering a way of automatically regularizing your, your learning system. Um, and this works quite well. Um, it also can be generalized. Uh, one interesting step that we've very recently taken um, and it's work in progress is optimizing loss functions for GANs, generally um, uh, adversarial neural networks. Uh, and here the loss functions are more complex because there's a discriminator and a generator. Uh, and uh, they have different loss functions. And also they, um, also the discriminator has a different function depending on whether the input is real or the input is fake. Uh, so you actually have three loss functions for each GAN. Uh, and here are a couple of standard GAN designs and the loss functions that they each have. And you can see that there are some differences between them. So you can guess that the loss functions actually matter for GANs. And here's a great opportunity to do better uh, because you can evolve them and maybe discover something that wasn't already known. Um, and and it in, indeed, it, GANs are great, but they are difficult to train. You, you have mode collapse and you have all kinds of instabilities. So, uh, so there is a problem here to be solved. Um, and uh, Santiago tried to solve it uh, using, using this uh, Taylor Glow approach. Uh, and indeed, it worked. Um, these are some preliminary experiments. Um, uh, the Taylor Glow discovered loss functions that utilize these different terms. Uh, and it, an actual visual example is facades where you can measure a performance of the GAN. I mean, GAN performance is a little complicated because it's a generative system. How do you actually know that your generated images are good? Well, here you can. You, have, you can look at the structure and whether it matches the facade that's your example. And you can also look at the perceptual distance, the actual bitwise distance. Um, and, um, and we used the VGG ImageNet uh, embeddings to, to compare the distance. So we had a distance function based on those embeddings. Uh, and here's one example. This is the input that's used to generate the output. This is the correct output, the actual data set item. Uh, and, and here's something that is, um, I think this was a Wasserstein gun generated. And this is what the loss function that we generated uh, or uh, evolved um, generated. So this one is actually a little better. It's not perfect, but it has more detail and it has a better overall color and, and it has a better sky, for instance, instead of this kind of a fading into the sky, it has a sharp boundary. So there are lots of reasons for um, um, preferring uh, these loss functions that were generated. Uh, and indeed, in these metrics that we had, both the structural and perceptual, there was a clear difference, statistically significant difference that uh, evolved loss functions resulted in better dance. 
Um, and this is, like I said, ongoing work. Uh, uh, we have to maybe adjust the approach a bit uh, and um, find data sets that are certainly larger where we can measure performance. Uh, but the premise is, is there that discovering loss functions for GANs can make GANs better. Um, and here's the synergy, optimizing the goal of what you're learning at the same time as you are learning uh, actually gives you more power. Okay, so that was the first uh, topic. Uh, the second one is optimizing activation functions, a second synergy. Uh, and, and here again, activation functions are part of the network design. You're always going through activation functions so can you learn those at the same time as you're learning the task? Um, well, originally, when we started in the dark ages, in the 90s, uh, we mostly used sigmoids and tanh and maybe Gaussians. Uh, and there was quite a bit of work to demonstrate that those are good choices, representation theorems from a long time ago. Uh, and and uh, it works, those work, especially in shallow networks. You can show that you don't need more than two layers if you have sigmoids, for instance. Uh, but then when deep learning came around, uh, it was discovered that the ReLU works better. Um, it has this uh, linear, piecewise linear approximation. It's more efficient to compute. And it has this um, infinite uh, extension, uh, which allows you to avoid vanishing gradients. Your gradients might vanish, your network might saturate because you are saturating your activation function, but this one does not saturate. So therefore it works in a uh, deep learning. Um, now, and also it was discovered, which is really interesting that small modifications to that can have large effect, usual effects. So this is something called swish. Uh, I think it was Quokli and um, his coworkers uh, discovered this, that a small change in this corner actually gives you much better performance than having this actual sharp corner that ReLU has. So this suggests that you could optimize those activation functions. Uh, if you had the time and effort to do it, uh, it might do better. And it might even be possible to do that separately for different tasks and architectures. Um, so that's the question. Can we find better functions? Can we specialize those functions to different tasks and architectures? And then the synergy would be that we evolve the shapes of the functions and then use gradient descent to optimize the parameters of the functions. Kind of like the loss, loss uh, function optimization that you would have different steps, but here we use gradient descent as the second step on, on those coefficients. Um, and this method is called Pangea and Garrett Bingham, a current PhD student at UT Austin um, has been working on this. Um, uh, and the results are quite fascinating. I mean, it turns out that there are functions that, not just, that are not just slight modifications of ReLU, uh, but actually have quite different shapes uh, from ReLU that work better in, 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 in various tasks. Um, so first of all, you need a search base. And similarly to what Santiago did with loss functions, you define a, a set of primitives, um, unary and binary um, primitives. Uh, and then you form computation graphs out of those primitives. And here we have really just two. Um, sequence of unary and one binary and two unary. Uh, and then you fill those slots from this table. That's what evolution does. Uh, tries to find a good computation graph. Um, and here are some of the um, uh, computational operators, evolution operators. You can, um, you can insert uh, a new, uh, new element, uh, remove or change something or regenerate the entire graph with different kinds of um, fillings. So uh, those, those are some of the genetic operators. And then you learn the parameters. Now, in principle, you could have a parameter at every node, multiplying every one of those primitives. But we found that that wasn't really necessary. And it's faster, more efficient if you just select a few. We decided to have three after some experimentation. And the location of those is, is de determined by evolution. Where do the coefficient appear um, um, is determined by evolution. And those parameters are learnable. That's what you learn with gradient descent. It turns out that you can derive gradient, um, gradients uh, for these parameters in these trees, and then you use gradient descent to modify them. So that's the synergy. Uh, and it turns out that it works quite remarkably well. Um, here are three experiments uh, discovering activation functions for different neural network architectures, wide ResNet and two different versions of ResNet. Uh, and, and here's the time 
uh, or in this case, it's actually a number of different activation functions that are evaluated. And then we are labeling some of the functions that, uh, that were discovered here. Uh, and they are quite interesting. Uh, many of them use the Swiss or an ReLU as an element, but they have various combinations of those and, and uh, multiplied sometimes by cosine or hyperbolic cosine and so on. Um, and, and there's, um, uh, let's see, there are other functions that have not been uh, uh, annotated, which may be more complex, but these are the ones that actually kind of make sense and are interesting and easy to read. Um, and then the ReLU accuracy, which is the default, but yeah, you just use ReLU. It's in the left axis here. So we're actually starting with something that's not quite as good, but very quickly in evolution, you improve upon ReLU. And here's the uh, white ResNet. This is the ReLU version, and this is what we discover. Uh, and here's the, the larger ResNet. Uh, and that's where we end up. So again, there's quite a bit of power in, act, in uh, modifying and customizing the activation function to the architecture. Uh, and uh, ReLU is just a starting point. You can do quite a bit better than that. But here's the interesting bit, again, kind of a surprise. It's always nice when you have a um, evolution <clears throat> discover something for you that you didn't already know. Um, so here's, here's uh, that bit, that the parameters, those coefficients in the, in, the, in the activation function, they actually change during training uh, and they are different at different parts of the network. So it turns out that you can opt optimize the activation functions through space and time. Uh, and there are principles like if you look at uh, shallow versus deep layers, uh, you'll see that there's this progression of um, less nonlinear, less more linear to more nonlinear. Uh, and similarly, over time, you see that these nonlinearities accentuate. Uh, and we believe that there's also kind of an intuition of why this makes sense, uh, in that in lower layers you are trying to form a good embedding and a very general and regular embedding. And then at the later layers, you're actually deciding on your categories and you're becoming a more decisive or more um, sharp boundaries between categories and you need more lin non-linearity to make those decisions. And that's what comes out from this synergy uh, of uh, gradient descent with, with evolution. Um, this is a big table, no need to look at all the numbers, but. This just shows you a big comparison when you when you publish papers these days, you have to run experiments until the, you know, um, until the sky, the sky turns blue, whatever. Uh, so here we have um, the different three different architectures. Here we have the functions that were discovered um, for each. And we also picked some of the architectures from the population that do well on all of those. Uh, and here are some of the baseline functions. A lot of functions have been proposed, not just ReLU and, and Swish somewhere here, but many versions of them. Um, and also some uh, activation functions that have parameters that you can optimize. Um, and it turns out that this customization of evolution and, and, and uh, gradient descent uh, results in best activation functions in all those cases. Um, the general ones do also much better than ReLU in general, uh, but the big power that you get is from customization. Um, so that's, that's the idea. Um, and of course, customization takes some time and takes some effort, but if you really care about it, if you are diagnosing lung diseases or whatever it might be, you want to squeeze out every bit of performance and it's worth spending the time uh, that it takes to activize the, uh, optimize the activation function so that you can, you, can, uh, you can get the maximum performance. And you can get that by the synergy that evolution and learning work together in order to find the best activation functions uh, for each task and architecture. Okay, now the third topic, and I do have three, this is the last one, but uh, this is perhaps um, the most timely one in some sense. Uh, the idea here is that what if we form a, yet another synergy uh, where the learning and evolution learn at the same time synergetically, but they perform different tasks. Um, and uh, this comes up in decision-making. Um, everybody has data now in the real world, whether you're in healthcare, retail, agriculture, web design, you have data about your, your, your patients, your customers, um, how well your plants perform, 
uh, how well the, the users behave in the website. Um, and we don't know how to design their environments best. Uh, we know how they perform in different environments, but we don't have any idea how to design optimal environments. Like what are the recipes we want to give the plants? How much water, what kind of temperature, what kind of light in order for them to grow the best? Um, and that's a different learning task uh, than, than actually predicting. So we are not talking about prediction. We're talking about intervention. We're talking about um, how to make things uh, work as well as possible. Um, we need to, there's no gradient descent that we can use. We need to actually evolve. We need to search for the optimal strategies. And also we can't test them in the real world. Um, if you do it in the plants, for instance, it might take three weeks for basil to grow before you know how well it grows. If you optimize in pecan trees, it might take 200 years. So you cannot evaluate your decisions in the real world, you need, you need a surrogate. Uh, and that's where the idea of, of uh, the synergy of learning and evolution comes from, um, that you build not just one model, but two models. Uh, you have one model uh, that's evolved and makes the prescriptions, makes the decisions. It's, it, it expresses a decision strategy. Yeah, that could be a neural network. It receives the context as its input and as, as its output it makes the decisions. So it might, for instance, tell you how much water, what temperature, and, and so on uh, to use for a particular plant under certain conditions. Uh, but then to evaluate how well uh, your decision strategy works, you can't plant those in the world. You need to ask a surrogate. That surrogate is the a second learning system. Um, and that can be just a standard supervised learning neural network. You train it with past history. You've observed these plants in the past. You have some examples of these contexts and these actions that we've done, this is how well the plant grew. Um, so it's a predictive task, a standard machine learning task, uh, and you need a certain amount of historical data, um, but you don't need to do that online. You can do that ahead of time. You can collect the data over hundreds of years if, if possible. And that kind of data sets all, already exist a lot. Um, so now you train your predictor first, and then you evolve your prescriptor against the predictor. In this manner, you learn to make decisions that work in the real world. Um, so um, this is the general outline of, of that system. Um, and you could start by first learning your predictor and then the prescriptor and you're done. Or you could learn both of them together. And that's again where the interesting synergy happens. Um, for instance, in game-like domains where you don't have a data set yet, you start with the random prescriptor and you describe actions that are not really informed. But when you do that, you get some data. Uh, in these contexts, these actions resulted in these outcomes. So now you have some data to train the predictor. Once you have a predictor, you evolve the prescriptor a bit, a little bit, uh, you get a better prescriptor. And now it prescribes better actions that result in better outcomes. And this way in this loop, multiple iterations in this loop, gradually focus the predictor on predicting what will happen with actions that actually lead to good predictions. Um, so both of these elements, the predictor and prescriptor, learn at the same time. And when you do that, there are interesting synergies. Uh, there's actually two. Uh, the first one is that, um, that the uh, incremental co-learning actually regularizes both models. They become better at, uh, at new examples because they learn uh, what the world structure is. Uh, and then the second one is that there's an automatic curricular learning. Uh, you learn simple things first and more complex later. Let's look at those. Um, so we need an illustration of this mechanism of co-learning. Um, and here is a starting point, um, very simple domain. <laughs> this is just a, one variable as a context and one variable as an action. Uh, and here is the optimal uh, outcome. So if your context, the input state, where you make your decisions. If that's a zero, it's a, it's eight, uh, then this color coding indicates what the optimal action is. It's about zero uh, in that case. If it's uh, minus one, then your optimal action is minus two. So that's how you read this, this graph here. It tells you how to map contexts through actions to optimal outcomes. Uh, and here's a plot that shows you what happens during learning. And we'll look at the, uh, a video in a minute, an animation in a minute. 
uh, and it has a little bit more information. Now the background is not actually the ground truth. The background is what the prescriptor, uh, sorry, <laughs> what the predictor thinks uh, you're learning. So it's saying that for this context, the optimal action is actually up here. Uh, for this context, this input, the optimal action is here. So the color coding tells you what the predictor thinks the task is. Um, the optimal, the actual optimal, the ground truth, the sine wave is in this blue dashed line. Um, and the current prescriptor, what we've learned so far as our decision strategy, that's the orange line. Um, and and uh, to compare uh, what the optimal prescriptor would be for the current predictor is in the white dotted line. And as you see, the white dotted line goes through the highest, um, the lightest areas of the background. So that's what should be optimal for the current predictor, but the prescriptor isn't quite there. And what's surprising, and I'm kind of giving you a punchline here, is that this prescriptor is not quite accurate with respect to what it should be given the predictor, but it's inaccurate in a way that's actually better it's closer to the actual sine wave, the ground truth. And that's amazing. And we thought in, initially that was just a lucky break, but it turns out it happens all the time. And that's the idea of co-learning, giving you regularization that in many tasks gives you better performance than you should have. All right, so let's look at a video how that happens. Uh, so initially we have a random predictor and prescriptor. And once we kick it off, both start learning at once. And you see this, approximations start to converge. So the background converges to something like a sine wave, and then the orange line converges to something like, uh, like the sine wave as well. And what's interesting is this white dotted line, which is the optimal given the current colored background, which is nothing like the sine wave, even though already the orange line is very close to it. Let's play that again. Uh, so the starting point here is nothing like a sine wave here but the orange line is already approaching. You play some more and the orange line starts to converge uh, like, uh, oops, like, like uh, let's see, wait a little bit, I re-clicked it. Like here, you can see that it's already more accurately approximating the sine wave than, than the predictor would allow. So what happens here is that during evolution, each prescriptor is evaluated through several different predictors. And because you have multiple predictions at different generations, then you have an ensemble. And when you have an ensemble, they make mistakes that are different. So on average, the evaluation uh, averages those and you get something that guesses what the function is. The random noise that is in the different predictors filters out and what you see is the sine wave. And that allows you to regu uh, uh, regularize and learn prescriptors that perform better than you might imagine. Um, now, how this, that's the first synergy. The second synergy is this, um, and this is just a conceptual illustration of it, that let's say you're trying to learn a function like this. This is what the predictor tries to learn. This is, this is the optimum. Now, initially, the predictor is not very good, um, and it sees samples. It can't quite follow all these uh, nooks and crannies, but it learns something that's an approximation of it. Now, this is a simpler function. And it's easier to learn uh, than this one. Um, so that's how you start with simple functions and you gradually make them more complex. What this means is that you have an automatic curricular learning. You're presenting simpler challenges first to the prescriptor learner uh, and then later on the more complex ones. All right, that's the concept. Let's see how that would play out uh, in something real. So this is the game of Flappy Bird. What does it mean to have curricular learning in Flappy Bird? Well, it means that you have a simpler task for the bird first uh, and then more complex. Um, so if you're not familiar with Flappy Bird, the idea is that you have a two minute window, you have to fly through this track. Uh, and that means that you flap in order to move up and then uh, gravity pulls you down. The pipes here appear in a regular speed. So you are flying through this obstacle course and trying not to crash into anything. Uh, and this is what happens during learning. Uh, I mean, sorry, this one is the actual performance. So you see what the task is. Uh, and you, and you, if you play this, you know that this is really hard. You have to flap 
just at the right time in order not to hit anything. And, and you have to count for gravity to bring you down. Uh, and, and that's the actual task. Uh, let's see what happens during um, ESP evolution. So very early on, the predictor does not know much. It predicts a world that's very simple. It just presents the learner a single hole. You know, Try to get through that first hole. And once you're through that, once you do that, the second one is presented very close by. So it's easy if you fly through the first hole, it's easy to get to the second one because it's right next to it. And once you learn to do that, you start to get more of these, but they are in the same level. And that's quite easy also. You just ha have to make sure that you're kind of roughly in the same level, and then you can fly through multiple pipes. And once you learn to do that, the predictor uh, starts predicting uh, these pipes that appear in different levels. And that's pretty much then the, the entire task. And I hope that you see the video. I forgot to turn off the, um, the um, well, optimize the, video, the display for video, but, um, but you can see this in a website. It's actually, if you go to this website, uh, that's where the videos live and, and you can run it in, uh, in perhaps in a more fidelity uh, manner. Um, so that's, that's the idea of synergy of a curricular learning. And as you can see, that can be very powerful. You can learn complex tasks. It turns out that you cannot learn that even, even if you evaluate it with the full pre predictor or even in a task like a simulator itself. So your predictor is perfect. It's harder to learn than learning it through this predictor that's gradually giving you more challenging uh, environments. Uh, so this is a good idea in general, you wanna do it anyway, but it turns out that a lot of times in, uh, in the real world, you have to do it this way because you don't have a model or data on what your environment is like. So that's how you get the synergy. So when you are using the learning as a surrogate, uh, then you get a synergy of regularization and you get a synergy of uh, shaping or curricular learning. Okay, now in the last couple of minutes, let me uh, look at an, a real world application of this ESP, um, still in the third category of synergy. Um, and that's something that we all have to have, you know, I've dealt with for the last couple of years, uh, the, the pandemic. Uh, and, and here the idea is that if we learn a predictor uh, to predict what will happen in the pandemic, how many cases there are, uh, given the current context of, of number of cases and the current restrictions on things like are the schools open, workplaces, what about transportation, contact tracing, masking, um, what will happen in the future? That's the predictor's task. It's the number of cases given the current restrictions. Um, the restrictions are MPIs, non-pharmaceutical interventions. So we don't look at uh, treatments or, or vaccinations. We look at non-pharmaceutical government uh, decisions on how to how to run the society, what parts of it to keep open and what parts to close. And this is, of course, a very big um, decision-making task, and it's been happening and replaying all around the world. Now, for two years, when we started, we were in April, May of 2020, uh, and, and, and we were hoping at the... We were worried about uh, predicting the closing right and then we were worried about predicting the reopening. And we had no idea that we wave after wave after wave. And still after two years, this, this model and this approach is relevant. It can still inform decision makers on what to do. And we've been running it, uh, retraining it continuously. Every night, we rerun the evolution and, and the training in order to get current models. And I'm gonna give you a demo in a minute. Uh, but that's a general idea. Uh, we are moving from prediction to prescription here. Everybody's been looking at these graphs since the beginning of the pandemic, trying to predict what will happen. Uh, but nobody else has been trying to do also the prescription part, not just what will happen, but what should you do about it? Should you open the schools, close the schools? Should you open uh, transportation, open borders or, or close them? What should you do? That's what this prescription model is supposed to tell you. Uh, and again, we learn them at the same time and you are adapting to the different stages of the pandemic. And that we've seen over and over again. The pandemic is not the same now and it was in the beginning. Uh, the world is very different. We have vaccinations. We have people who are anti-vaxxers, anti-maskers, all kinds of um, idiots and so on. But, uh, and also we have a lot more people who are past immune, uh, but then Omicron came around and it wasn't immunity anymore. It was kind of a partial immunity. So the 
there are constant changes and the models will have to change with it. And that's why this general idea of co-learning the prescriptor and predictor um, works. All right, so the first step is to train with available data. And it turned out that at the same time, the Oxford uh, team um, came up with the government response tracker. They collected the data all around the world. They have a couple of hundred people um, scanning various reports in order to figure out what the government has decided to do, what the MPIs are. And so we have a day, uh, time series of those decisions, as well as, of course, the time series of cases. Well, not all countries are really reporting them ad adequately and accurately, but accurately enough in most countries that we can learn from. Um, and then we are using a data-driven approach. We are training a neural network uh, to make the predictions uh, based on the, uh, the time series of cases as well as time series of, of the restrictions. I mean, you can build and you can utilize SEIR models, the standard epidemiological models, but it's very hard to parameterize them so that they're accurate, especially when those parameters are changing over time. So instead we use the data set and we continuously learn it again and again and again. And the models change as the pandemic changes. Uh, and this is our decision maker, the prescriptor. Uh, it takes the same time series as input and then it recommends what to do, what kind of restrictions to have in different dimensions. Now, in evolving this, we have two objectives. Um, come up with restrictions that minimize the number of cases, but try to do it with as little economic cost as possible. So try to keep things as open as possible while minimizing the cases. So you do get a Pareto front, you get different solutions from which the um, decision maker then have to choose. Um, and it's been fascinating to follow these systems, how they learn and what they learn. Um, and it, uh, even especially early in the pandemic, looking at the models gave us insight that we didn't have yet into the pandemic. About two weeks in advance, several times, something happened in the models and, and we're looking at it going like, what the heck is that? Why is it doing that? It's gotta be wrong, something is wrong. And then sure enough, two weeks later, we understood what it was doing. So for instance, very early on in May, 2020, uh, it recommended closing schools and workplaces. It didn't really care about other things as much just schools and workplaces. And of course that has a lot of economic damage, but it turns out that's where the pandemic spread. When you are indoors eight hours a day with other people, and there were not even masks at the time, um, that's when the pandemic actually gets transmitted. And two, sure enough, two weeks later, people started, uh, and articles came out that, that, um, that pointed that out, that that's where we have to be most careful. So the models discovered that first, before, before it became really a public, public uh, knowledge. Uh, a few months later, it started expanding the gatherings and, and travel, uh, but it let oh, schools open a bit. And it turned out that schools actually adapted. Uh, they had distancing, they had ventilation, they had even plastic dividers around the, uh, the desks and, and, and schools were something that no longer were that, that dangerous uh, regarding the pandemic. But other things then spread out like travel. Um, in March of last year, we had a big peak predicted in India. And again, we really thought that there was a problem. There was something wrong with the models. Well, that's where the Delta search really started. India had a hit, Delta hit India really hard. And then a few months later, it hit in other countries. And, and the models predicted that in each country pretty much to the point uh, uh, where it's going to happen and, and when. Uh, and that was fascinating to see. Uh, and then another fascination, fascinating thing happened just uh, a, a couple of months ago, and that was the Omicron. And it was really interesting that the models actually did not do a great job in predicting Omicron. Uh, and the reason was that Omicron was different. It was spreading even through the population that we vaccinated and had had COVID before. Um, so the assumptions we put into the prediction, you can put, uh, you can train a neural network with certain assumptions like uh, population immunity and, uh, and things like that, uh, which restricted the shapes of the predictions. They no longer were valid. Um, so we had to change the type of model that we're using. We took out some of those restrictions and now we are just training the predictors based on data and they, they perform a lot better. Um, so it's interesting and fascinating how these models actually lead to insights about the pandemic. And I very briefly uh, want to show you a demo. 
And you can go on, uh, on this website on your own uh, and explore it. It's quite um, captivating. Uh, this is in evolution at ML. Um, and, uh, and it's actually slash demos MPI uh, dashboard. Uh, and here you have an interactive uh, opportunity to, do, uh, to interact with the models. So it's an interface that allows you to do that. So first you select a country, um, and this is for instance, US, uh, and then you get two plots. You get the predictor and you get the prescriptor. Uh, so the prediction now shows, this actually shows the entire history of the pandemic. And you see the Omicron wave hit, which is totally in a different ballpark. That's why the models didn't really work so well because it was so different from what had been happening before. Uh, the Delta was still within the range. So it was easy to predict, Omicron wasn't. Uh, now we see that the cases have come down uh, and just yesterday was the first day that I saw that it's starting to come back up again. Uh, so that's a cause of this uncertainty. We also estimate the uncertainty of the prediction. So it looks like if uh, we use the AI's predictions or prescriptions, sorry, um, which are here, this is the current time today uh, in this orange line, this is the entire history of prescriptions over the same time course. Um, and today, the AI, the, the prescriptor neural network, is telling us that keep the restrictions in place just for a while, a few more weeks, and then you can open up the society completely. That's what it's telling us. And it makes sense given the path that we are on. Um, but if you open it up, there's actually a lot of uncertainty. It should be okay but there's a lot of uncertainty. That's what the models are telling us. Um, and that is, it makes sense. Um, this is a very unusual time in the, in the history of the pandemic, but the, the predictions and prescriptions are, uh, make sense. Something very interesting is happening on the other side of the world. If you look at, sorry, if you look at um, UK, for instance, and England there, England has often been ahead of US um, in a lot of these, uh, developments, they, they have a tendency of opening up things too quickly and then getting another wave much faster. And that seems to be happening. Precisely that seems to be happening in UK. They hit the Omicron earlier and they got out of it almost and then they completely opened up everything and now, now, now the, um, uh, the pandemic is coming back. Um, and here, um, it turns out that we can bring it down if we have um, if you continue some of these restrictions longer, uh, we can bring down the pandemic. Um, now, here are some choices that make it interesting to interact with the model. If we maintain the current state of what they have, which is a lot more open, uh, it's, it's shown here by these light colors, very few restrictions. It turns out that the, um, the, the next wave is gonna be almost as high as the previous, previous Omicron wave. Now, um, so, so one of some of these restrictions that the AI is making, like it's telling us to close schools and, and workplaces, for instance, um, they are not really nice. So we might want to explore some other um, alternatives. So let's use an interface called custom MPIs and we can interact with the system a little bit more. We can go here and edit. Um, what uh, AI is giving or edit the current restrictions. So we'll go here and here are um, the current restrictions, current NPIs. Um, and maybe we want to say that, okay, let's bring back the mask mandate. Um, not completely, maybe this is, I think this is just still indoors and apply that. We, we change the current restrictions so that people should wear masks and let's see what effect it has. This is the current prediction. This is what will happen if we bring back the masks. So this tells the decision makers exactly what they should do. Bring back the masks and you'll be okay. Don't do it and you'll have another peak that's about the same as it was in January. Um, so this is the way to interact with the model. You can explore different alternatives. Um, you can also do counterfactuals. You can go back in time and see, and see what would have happened if you had been smarter earlier, it's kind of, you know, hindsight is 2020, but, but you can do it because you have the models. So uh, we'll go and select a date. Let's go back to the beginning of that, um, that second peak here, like the 20th of February um, and see where we are, what we could do there. 
um, we have the models, we can go back to back in time and that interface tells you where we have models saved. Um, and it'll, it's a little slow because I have the zoom going on. And here you see what actually happened, this purple line. Uh, and now we can see by zooming in what would, what would have happened if we hadn't lifted the mask mandate. Uh, if we hadn't lifted all the restrictions, we would be okay. We would not have had the second peak at all or second Omicron peak at all. Um, so this is the way to interact with the model and I recommend you take a look. Uh, it's quite fun. It changes every day. If you don't like something about it, it might be different the next day. It's not perfect by any means. I mean, it still makes mis mistakes. The different countries don't always work out. Uh, in Spain, by the way, I forgot to say, Spain is very much the same as the US at this point. It suggests that things are going okay, but, but there's a lot of uncertainty and uh, you might be interested in looking into that. Um, okay, so that was a real world example of this synergy of learning and, and evolution. And just to conclude, um, so current neuroevolution is not just a non-gradient learning approach that applies to situations where you don't have targets, or it's not also just an outer loop where you optimize an inner loop. There are actually synergies when you're doing both at the same time. And I gave three examples of discovering learning goals while learning, discovering activation functions while learning, and discovering predictions while you're learning the prescriptions. Uh, and you get something that's more than the sum of its parts. You get these insights of regularization, of, of uh, embeddings and decision-making, uh, 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 categorization, and then these synergies of, of regularization as well as curricular learning. Uh, and we believe that there's more synergies to be discovered. One thing that uh, we haven't done is to try to learn multiple aspects together, like learning activation functions while you're also learning loss functions uh, and, and uh, maybe also optimizing the architecture at the same time. Um, and I, I believe that this is the wave of the future um, of, of meta-learning as this system that has multiple aspects that all are adjusted at once and in, in a synergy. So with that, I'd like to stop and, and I think we still have time for questions, quite a bit of time for questions. So go ahead. Okay, thanks a lot. Very, very nice question. Very nice presentation, sorry. So now it's time for questions uh, from the audience. So don't hesitate to use the chat to write your questions or to raise your hand and ask for your turn to speak. Uh, Carlos Núñez Molina has a question, so please go ahead, Carlos. Uh, hi, hey. can you uh, can you hear me? Yes, yeah, sure. Oh, oh, so first of all, I thank you very much for your like presentation. Like it was really really interesting. So I have a question about uh, the prescriptive part because you talk about a predictor, and that sounds very familiar to models in model based reinforcement learning. So when you say you're learning a predictor, what you're learning is a model of the environment that can output uh, the resultant state after executing an action and also the reward, or what are you learning? Yeah, that's that's very much. I mean, one way to describe it is that it is precisely that. It's a, uh, the task is in a sense a reinforcement learning. You get a reinforcement signal. Uh, it is the, uh, in this case, it's the number of cases um, and also the uh, cost of those uh, actions. Um, and, and you are using the model to predict that. So um, what's different is uh, the methods that you do have a, you do have a neural network training uh, to be the predictor a neural network uh, training to be the decision maker. And also that it's a multi-objective uh, and both are learning at once. Uh, in, we did do a comparison with reinforcement learning. It's in this paper, not, not in this pandemic paper, but in the Gecko 2021 paper uh, where, um, where this example was. Um, and and uh, it turns out that it's actually quite a bit more sample efficient to do it in, in this manner um, using, using the evolutionary approaches. Uh, but the high level setup is exactly the same. It's the implementation that matters and the synergies that come out um, and also some of the other aspects like multi-objectivity and so on. I see. So, for example, when you're training, like uh, when you're evolving this uh, predictor and prescriptor, so how is the uh, predictor trained? So is it trained, like optimized to 
uh, predict the outputs that correspond to the environment, or is the whole uh, model trained end-to-end to produce good predictions? Um, let's see. Yeah, so this, this is the general setup, and, and there are two extremes of it, in, two extreme instantiations of it. So in one case, you could start with an entire data set uh, that you have from, from the past, uh, and that means that you know what the situations were, the context. You knew, know what was done and you know what the outcome was. So you might have a big table like that, uh, thousands of, of examples like that. And then you can train the predictor entirely and you don't have to touch it anymore. You have the model. And now you are just learning based on that static model uh, to, to make the prescriptions that give you the best outcomes. Uh, but that's not really the most interesting case. The more interesting case is that you start with the predictor and prescriptor that are both unknown um, and both are initially random. Uh, and that says you do some random exploration, which becomes still training data, not very good training data because you might have actions that are not so good, uh, but you are able to start the predictor. It's like random flailing of, of robotic arm that you're doing in the beginning, uh, that those are your decisions. And you are learning both at once. So once the predictor gets better, you get a better prescriptions. Better prescriptions give you more accurate predictions where it matters. Uh, but it's not an end-to-end -end system because there's actually this two separate learning algorithms and two separate models. So they are co-learning. They're learning at the same time. Both are getting better at the same time, but using different models and different uh, mechanisms. So uh, they so, just interact, yeah. So if you have, if, if I understood it correctly, so like the, you train the predictor to predict the correct outputs, and then you train the prescriptor to, uh, for example, to uh, select the good actions, not yeah. end to end, but uh, every part like uh, at the same time, but also with different uh, objective functions. Um, yeah, that's one way to look at it. Um, the objective functions are the same. The objective function like here is number of cases is one and the cost of the, I don't know how that happened. The cost of the uh, MPIs is another objective function, uh, but the values of those objective functions depend on the current predictor. So even if you have the same situation and make the same recommendation at different stages of learning, you would get a different value uh, for the predicted number of cases because your predictor is different. Um, so, you know, functions are the same, but the way you calculate it changes. Uh, and you're learning that as, as you go. Um, so that's what it means to co-learn the model, the surrogate, uh, at the same time as you learn the decision maker. So it is in sense, some sense we are learning uh, to make decisions against a moving target. Okay, okay, thank you. I understand it now. Great, thanks. Okay, we have one question in the chat. Dear professor, if you use data to predict COVID, your model always changes based on different data, then how to estimate the effectiveness of your method? Because your prediction results also change with time. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, you, this, is, this is technical, but you do have to leave out some period of time for validation. And, and that's what you, usually we, and we experimented with that. That was actually the latest thing we did with, with the Omicron, like how much time do you need uh, as past history? Uh, and then how much time do you need to evaluate your current models, whether they're accurate? And it turns out that uh, you can do pretty well, even if you just look at the last two days and uh, in order to estimate how good your predictions are uh, and how good your prescriptions are. But, but in practice, we actually use 21 days, so three weeks. And the reason for that is that for any restriction to have an effect, you know, open the schools or close the transportation, it takes about three weeks before you can see any effect in the number of cases, because that's how long it takes for the disease to transmit and, and incubate and, and then get detected. Uh, so we do have to have an evaluation period of about three weeks before we actually can tell whether our predictors are good. Um, and, and we do generate a number of these predictors from different starting point, And we look at both how accurate they are and how sensitive they are uh, to the decisions. So, so the predictor has to make 
you know, if, if you open up the economy, it has to make worse case predictions than, than if, you, if you close down the economy. So there are some sanity checks there as well. And we are selecting from the population. Now, you know, the, the, the scientific picture is very clear how you do it. The practical implementation, you have to make these uh, technical choices so that you squeeze out every bit of information you possibly can. And these are some of those things that using different windows, using different metrics to evaluate the predictors so that you get the best possible, um, possible ones for your, for your learning. Thanks a lot. More questions? Any question in the room? Like I can make a question um, in the meanwhile. Um, from my, at least from my experience, most papers on neuroevolution work with uh, relatively small neural nets applied to commonly relatively simple problems. So I like to ask you uh, if you are aware of strategies or techniques that are commonly applied to very deep networks to train them or to evolve the architectures and that they are used, uh, actually using computer visions in a state of the art computer vision problems. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's, yes, absolutely. The, so, as I said in the beginning, the, the early neural evolution evolved the entire network with its weights and parameters, everything. There was no learning at all. Uh, what I've talked about with the loss function and activation function optimization, we are actually evolving um, just an aspect of the design, meta learning it, and then we are using the regular training. So, these networks are large. I mean, they are. ResNets uh, and they are you know 56 layers and and uh, wide ResNets and uh, and so on. Uh, but but we are not evolving the entire network. Um, so that's part of the answer is that you can use neuroevolution in synergy with uh, the deep learning. And now you are really modeling or and optimizing the design of a deep learning architecture. And they can be any kind of large architectures. Uh, and we've certainly used very large architectures, even larger than. Uh, than, than people have proposed, automatically proposed. Um, and there are other people who work on that too. And Esteban Real in particular, and, and Quoclis Group and Google Brain, they um, evolved um, something called AmidaBanet a few years ago that was the state of the art in ImageNet, um, better than any human design. Um, and I think it might be some other something else like that currently. Um, but again, it was a, a method of neuroevolution that optimized part of the design. And then there was a mechanism of creating a larger version of it by copying and, and uh, expanding uh, that then was trained as a deep neural net, a very large one that performed at state of the art level. Um, but there are some ideas also how you could use the original neuroevolution idea of evolving the entire network, including the weights and not having the back propagation uh, gradient descent at all. Uh, deep learning at all. It's entirely evolution-based. Uh, for instance, the former Uber group uh, came up with an approach where uh, there was an algorithm from a small uh, compressed encoding. Um, you can expand into a, a series of weights, and then you are evolving that compressed encoding and embedding, if you will, and then you generate the weights of the entire network. Uh, so that's still possible. I mean, if you try to directly evolve all the weights, you have 100 million parameters and evolution of 100 million parameters is relatively slow. <laughs> but if you're smart about it, you have only maybe 10,000 parameters and then you expand it to 100 million parameters using this kind of mechanism. And that, that does work and it, it worked quite well. Um, but that's still a relatively open question. How do you really do it? Uh, and are there better ways of doing it? Uh, would you even want to? Maybe, maybe uh, we are just haven't had the idea yet how to do that better. Uh, but currently, so currently, with, with respect to large neural architectures, uh, the state of the art is meta learning, so you are evolving design. Um, and and uh, then perhaps in the future, we can expand and actually evolve the entire network. Okay, perfect, thanks a lot. So any other question? More questions in the room? No? So well, we can thank the, the speaker. Thanks a lot, uh, Professor Nikulainen. And uh, thanks again for accepting our invitation and for this very nice talk. Um, yeah, thanks course, for the discussion. Very interesting uh, and good luck.
Thank you. Thanks. Uh, th thanks a lot also to all the attendees also. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks, Natalia. Bye.